I hated this tone. Welcome back to the channel. I'm Arjun Ryan Kilio. If you're new here, thanks for joining me. I like to consider myself as someone that appreciates all types of music, all different styles of guitar playing, and all different types of guitar tones. But there is this one guitar tone that I absolutely hated for the majority of my life. And now I'm just totally obsessed with it. And in this video, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about it and how I've actually managed to create it, recreate it, using no amplifiers and almost no pedals whatsoever. But before we get started, if you're into these kinds of videos, make sure you click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon to stay notified of whenever I release a new video or whenever I go live on my YouTube channel. So the tone I hated was this. So what is it exactly? It's that distinctively 80s, overly processed, overly polished, clean tone, totally drenched in stereo chorus and digital stereo delay and digital reverb. And granted, it was utilized by so many of my favorite guitar players from back then, Steve Lukather, Michael Landau, Michael Thompson, but it was also tied to a certain style of music that I just didn't like back then. And it was kind of that pop, kind of light rock style, which I know today as being called AOR. And if you've been following me for a little bit now, you've known that I've talked about this on my live stream that I've been obsessed with this AOR style music. And if you don't know, AOR stands for Album Oriented Rock, which in a nutshell is basically rock that your parents can listen to. Corporate rock, what I like to call rock with reservations. Essentially, it's the exact musical equivalent of the mullet haircut. You know, like really corporate business in the front and party on in the back. So why did I hate this guitar tone? Well, it came at a weird period in the 80s when I was just starting to learn guitar. This was, you know, the mid 80s. And you got to think about what was on the radio and what was on MTV. You had everything from, you know, R&B to pop, all levels of, of rock music from like, you know, Huey Lewis to hair metal like Rat. You had all these virtuosic shredder types like Steve Vai and Eddie Van Halen and Satriani and Ingve. But what I was listening to back then when I was just starting to learn guitar was the obvious guitar players. I listened to everybody from Clapton to Hendrix to Eddie Van Halen to Steve Vai. So the guitar parts that you heard in the pop music and the, the light rock AOR music, that type of guitar playing kind of took a back seat to what, what the rest of the musical landscape was doing with guitar. And probably a lot of it was just the, the style of the music, the style of the production. You know, it kind of shared the same range as the synthesizers. So for me, it was kind of hard to distinguish what was, you know, a clean guitar part or what was a synthesizer part. For that simple fact, I didn't like it. I didn't like that guitar tone because it sounded too poppy. It sounded too much like a digital synth. And on top of that, to me, those actual songs were like really cheesy. So it never entered my mind to really listen to these guitar parts and guitar tones. And it wasn't really until I went to college in the 90s when one of my classmates had introduced me to Michael Landau. So that's when I really started learning about these LA studio guitar players. Uh, everybody from, let's say, Jay Graydon, Steve Lukather, Paul Jackson Jr., Michael Landau, Michael Thompson, these guys. Uh, that's when I started to appreciate their guitar playing. Now, I didn't necessarily start getting into the, the music or the guitar tones then, just the guitar playing and these particular guitarists. Uh, but fast forward to now, I guess now that I'm in my 40s, what you call a mature musician, I've started to appreciate more of the music of my childhood that I never got into. You know, I've been listening to more of that stuff like Richard Marks and Kenny Loggins and Steve Perry and basically anything that David Foster produced. And honestly, I started to fall in love with this guitar tone, probably because it was new to me. I mean, it's been around since the 80s, but I never tried to mirror that 
style of tone in my own rig. I took it as a challenge to like, maybe I should try to recreate this sound. And like with anything that I, I really get into, you know, I did a deep dive into YouTube and my friend Mason Marangella from Vertex actually put out a great video about uh, the evolution of wet, dry, wet, 80s, 90s, and now. And in the video, he kind of explains the different rig setups uh, back then that guys with like Lukather and Landau were using. And I'll put a link to it up here and down in the description so you can check it out as well. But Mason did a really good job of kind of explaining the different setups and the signal flow. But essentially it was, you went guitar into your amplifier and then it was loaded down so it could work with a variety of rack effects. Uh, first, it would usually go into a compressor to really squash down the signal. Uh, they usually went into a DBX-160A compressor, which was kind of like the main uh, compressor that was in the racks. And then they would go into an EQ uh, because when you compress your guitar signal, as heavily as they did, you lose a lot of your high end. So I think they would uh, then EQ it after the compressor to bring back the, uh, the presence and kind of the brightness of the tone. So from there, this is where it gets interesting. This is where they start dumping in all of their wet effects and their time base effects. So usually after the compressor and EQ, they would go into a, a parallel line mixer, like a rain parallel line mixer so they could mix in a variety of effects from their chorus which was usually the uh, Dynatronics tri-stereo chorus and then they would also add in like an eventide style chorus uh, what they call like the detune uh, which is found like in the the famous big H3000 rack so they would have like kind of two choruses going at the same time and, and mind you this is all done uh, to get a stereo signal that's the key, is um, a stereo guitar sound. Um, then they would also use, obviously, digital reverb, and then splash on a bunch of stereo delay. And you gotta think about why they built these huge, excessive racks with this really complicated signal flow. And the reason was they wanted to recreate um, the sound that they were getting out of the, the studio gear. I can only imagine that it started with you know, one of the session guys just having just an amp that was mic'd up, and then the engineer of the studio would process all that stuff through the uh, outboard equipment in the control room, whether it was the, the the compressor, the EQ, all of the chorusing and reverbs and delays. So the studio guys, the, the session players, the guitarists, wanted to recreate that signal flow and have it all self-contained so they could go from session to session and have a consistent guitar sound. Basically, they wanted to be a self-contained studio for just their guitar sound. And it got to the point, I think even in the early 90s, I think Michael Thompson was saying that they would bring their own microphones and their mic pre's run it through all of their outboard gear that was in their racks and just send the engineer to XLRs and say, here, here's my guitar sound. And it was already processed, ready to go, ready to print on tape and whatnot. So I thought about how I could recreate it now. Clearly, I'm not going to spend tens of thousands of dollars on 80s rack gear. Plus, I don't have space to put all that stuff. And then I thought about recreating it with pedals. And the more I thought about it, trying to recreate it with pedal effects can be just as difficult and just as expensive. And then I thought about why these guitar players built these racks, which was to recreate their, their studio sound. And today our studios are basically condensed, digitized, computerized versions of the studios back then. Everything is in the box, in the computer. We use plugins. And I figured it out and I actually was able to recreate very convincingly this clean 80s guitar tone just using my computer, you know, my recording setup, my audio interface, maybe a pedal. And I'm going to let you hear it and show you how I did it. So many of you know that I've been using uh, universal audio uh, recording devices to record all of my 
gear demos, all of my YouTube videos. Now I should say Universal Audio is not sponsoring this video. Uh, they're not paying me to make this. This is something that I wanted to do because I thought it was cool enough to share with you guys. Uh, right now I'm using a UAD X8. Now I realize that all this information I'm about to talk about may not be useful to you if you do not own one of these UAD interfaces, but hopefully you'll find it interesting that one is capable of recreating this kind of studio routing like they did in the 80s, but in a more modernized, compact, in-the-box form. So if you're not familiar with the UAD stuff, when you do buy one of their interfaces, it comes with this app called uh, Console. And what it is, it kind of models this, um, like an outboard mixer that you would find in a studio. So you have the option to create sends to different effects. You can insert different effects. You can have all these different monitoring options. So I have uh, the session that I created uh, pulled up. Normally when you open it up, there's a ton of different uh, input channels, output channels, all that stuff, but I condensed it so it's easier for us to, to look at. So we're only looking at the, the channels that I'm using. So essentially what I've done is kind of, I guess, reversed engineered an 80s uh, session rack. Remember when I said the 80s racks were modeling the signal flow of a guitar going through uh, recording studios outboard effects. So that's how I thought about uh, doing this signal flow and it's a little bit complicated but hopefully you'll understand how it works. So basically my guitar is plugged in directly into my audio interface and one of the cool things about the UAD stuff is uh, it has this unison technology where when you plug into the, uh, the front of the interface it can react the same way as if uh, you were plugging into the front of an amp or directly into a mixing console. And there's tons of really cool uh, plugins that UA offers. Everything from, I mean, here's some of them. You got all these delays, compressors, EQ, specific guitar and bass amps and pedals, um, tape machine stuff. Um, some, some stuff I haven't even checked out yet, but preamps and channel strips. So right now I'm plugged directly to the front of the audio interface. The first plugin that I'm going through is a model of an amp. And UA, thankfully, has a ton of cool uh, amp models to choose from. But the one that I chose to go into is the Sir PT100. Now, if you followed my channel for a while, you know that I actually own the hardware version of this amplifier. So it's kind of natural that I would pick this, but also I just think this is a great three channel amplifier. It's got a great clean channel, overdrive distortion. And I feel like it's almost like something that they would have chosen uh, back in the eighties had this been around. So right now I just have like a basic clean sound. <laughs> You know, normal old clean sound. So going back to the original signal flow that we were working with, we know that they went from the amplifier straight into the compressor. Now they were using a DBX-160A uh, rack compressor. UA doesn't have that exact 160A model, but they do have the DBX-160, which I believe is pre pretty close. Um, and this is going to squash my signal. <laughs> So you can see that it's really getting squashed. Here's the original. Now I'm going to slap on the compressor. Now you can hear that the high end kind of disappeared. So what they did and what I'm going to do is put, a com uh, put an EQ after it to kind of liven it back up. So what I have pulled up is just an Oxford EQ. It doesn't have to be any special model of EQ. They all basically do the same thing. Uh, but you can see here, I kind of cut the bass right around 100 uh, with a pretty hard shelf. And then I like to liven it up right around here, um, set at like 2800 to 3, I'm sorry, 2800 to 3000 um, hertz. And then I also like to add a little bit right around 10K. Here's how it sounds without it. <laughs> So you can hear that it kind of brightened the guitar tone back up after we compressed it. Okay, cool. So that's kind of like my dry signal chain 
on, my, on the guitar channel. Now, if we go back to the original diagram, after all of this, they start putting in all their chorus, reverb, and delay. And the way they did that was with a line mixer. So they were able to control their mix and really fine tune and dial it in. So within the console application, by default, you have these uh, two aux channels that you can put in different effects and send, like I can send my guitar, my dry guitar sound to these uh, auxes and mix in whatever effects I have. The effects that we're gonna be using are gonna be reverb, delay, and a couple choruses. Um, so I had to figure out how I was going to route everything. Um, and I just decided that I'm gonna put my time-based stuff on the two aux channels just because that's how I normally do it in the past. So on aux one, I've got my uh, reverb plugin, which they didn't have the exact lexicon reverb that they were using in the racks, but this Lexicon 224 plugin is another kind of industry standard from those days, I guess. And it's a really nice digital reverb, and it allows me to go stereo. So let me play you what it sounds like with the, the reverb in stereo. It sounds better with headphones, so make sure you're watching this on either a nice uh, stereo system or with headphones, so you can really hear it. And the great thing uh, about it being on an aux channel is I can kind of mix it in. So here it is without any reverb. And now I can gradually bring it in with this fader. I can max it out. But for now, let's keep it uh, at zero. Now moving on to aux two, aux channel two, uh, this is where I wanted to put my delays. Now UA didn't have a plugin of the exact, you know, delay that they were using in the racks, but I just pulled up their, um, what is the precision delay mod, which is a stereo delay, a lot of features, but I just have it set um, to this sound. <laughs> So it's kind of panning, uh, ping-ponging right, left, right, left. It really pairs well with the reverb. Even before we put the chorus on, uh, it sounds killer. Give it a little more delay. So that's my dry guitar signal going into the reverb and the delay. But we're forgetting the most important part, which is the chorus sound. If we look at the diagram, you'll see that a lot of times they used two different chorus sounds. They went into uh, a tri-stereo chorus, like a diatronic tri-stereo chorus, and then they would go into the eventide. So now we have to think about how we're going to add the chorus in. Like I said, by default, uh, we only have these two aux channels to use, and I've already used them up for my reverb and delay. Now, I thought about just putting a chorus plugin after the EQ on my main dry guitar channel, but the problem with that is my guitar channel is set to mono, and if I put a, a chorus on there, it'll only be a mono signal. And the beauty of the 80s tone was the tri stereo chorus, stereo chorus, left and right. So, I didn't want it going mono. I wanted the full immersive stereo chorus effect. So I had to figure out a way to get some other aux channels available to run it. There is a hack that I discovered. There's a way to this. If we look at our sends on our guitar channel, we have aux one, which is going to our lexicon reverb, and we have aux two, which is going to our delay. But then we have these two Q1 and Q2, which normally are reserved for like headphone mixes, but there is a way you can use them as uh, sends or buses. If you go to this panel, Q outputs, if you switch this over to Q1 and Q2 as the source, and then change the mirror output uh, to three and four on Q1, and five and six on Q2, this is what creates two extra sends or buses that you can put more effects on. On the back panel of the interface, you have inputs and outputs for lines one through eight. 
So what I did was I took a cable and ran it from the line out of three, which would be our Q1, and then routed it back into the line input of channel five. And then I linked the channel five and six together so it would be a stereo channel. And that way I could put a chorus on that channel and it would come out as stereo. So that's what I did. There's actually a cable running out of the uh, interface and back in just so I can get this one chorus sound. This channel, which is uh, five and six, houses my tri-stereo chorus. Now it's a beautiful thing that UA was able to model this as a plugin because the Diatronics tri-stereo chorus was the analog chorus, distinctively 80s. And here's how it sounds. So here's my, my dry signal with the reverb and the delay. Now here it is with the beautiful tri-stereo chorus. So hopefully you can hear a little bit of the left and right chorusing going on. And I don't know exactly what the settings are, but I saw a couple videos of people using an actual vintage hardware version of this, and this is kind of where the knobs were set, so this is where I set them. Oh, also, by the way, I put another compressor after it just to compress the chorus signal a little bit, just to keep it nice and even. But the cool thing about this setup is... Right now, that's my dry signal together with the chorus. I can totally shut off my dry signal and, and just hear the chorus guitar with the uh, reverb and delay. It sounds like this. Now adding my dry signal back in. It makes it sound a little bit fuller. We're not done yet because looking back at the original diagram, you might have remembered that there's another chorusing effect that they were using. They were using like an even tide, for all intents and purposes, like an H3000 sound. All of the studio guys had it at some point. And unfortunately, UA doesn't make or hasn't yet made a plugin for the H3000. Luckily, I have a pedal that has the exact H3000 algorithm, and it's the even tide pitch factor, what my understanding has the same exact same algorithms. So what I did is there's actually a stock patch called H3000. So I dialed that in and from watching, you know, some of the Michael Thompson videos, the way he likes to set it is there are settings to adjust the, uh, the offset of the pitch on the chorusing. And where he likes to do it, I think is plus nine and minus nine. So I was able to dial that in exactly. And what I found out, it sounds a little bit different than the tri-stereo chorus. It's a different kind of lushness, a little more digital sounding. So now the way to route this is similar how he routed the tri-stereo chorus plugin. So I took a cable out of line five, plugged it directly into the pedal, which is sitting on my desk. And this has a stereo output. So I took two cables out of the pedal for stereo and routed it back in to my interface, um, analog seven and eight. So this is my stereo channel for this Eventide uh, harmonizer, H3000 sound. And this is what this chorus sounds like. I'm gonna shut off the tri-stereo chorus so you can hear just the H3000 sound with my dry signal. Dry signal. <laughs> Because the signal level uh, from the pedal was so low, I actually put a uh, preamp, a model of uh, a Neve 1073 uh, preamp and EQ in line to boost the signal, but also EQ it a little bit and give it a little extra brightness. And with all the other channels, I also put the same DBX160 compressor just to even everything out. That sounds killer by itself, but let's add in the tri-stereo chorus so you can hear both of them together. Yeah. 
And there it is. That that is just like such an quintessential 80s clean tone a la Lukather Landau, Huff, Michael Thompson. so nice so i was happy with this sound i was extremely um pleased with the way this turned out i like how i can control you know my dry signal here i have control over my tri-stereo uh level my even tide level and then you know reverb and delay so it's almost better than what they had back in the 80s rack days because now i have control over every single element of this uh, sound. But I didn't stop there because there's something that I heard in certain recordings that I don't even know if they exactly did this, what I'm about to do, but I thought it would be cool. Sometimes I would hear a, a certain shimmer kind of fade into like one side, like the right side, and I wanted to recreate that. And it was probably something that the engineer did you know, while they were mixing, but I kind of wanted to recreate that while I was playing in real time. So what I actually did was, on the Eventide pedal, instead of going from my audio interface directly into the pedal, I actually went from the audio interface into a volume pedal that's on the floor right now, into the uh, Pitch Factor pedal, back into the uh, interface. And what this allows me to do is actually swell in the Eventide H3000 effect. And what I did was actually I panned everything to the right side. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to fade in with the H3000 and it's going to come in on your right side and it's going to be a little more shimmery than the regular chorus sound. <laughs> Bring it up just a little bit. So now I have even more control as if I'm actually mixing in real time my guitar signal. And what I like to do with this now is if I'm doing an arpeggiated uh, pattern or something like... When I hit that last strum, I like to add in the H3000 so it kind of rings out on the right side, like... So that's it. That's kind of my my ultimate 80s clean tone LA session musician setup that I've recreated uh, just on my computer. But I didn't have to buy any rack gear. Now I could use this exact signal chain even with like dirt for really Steve Lukather sounding solo. <laughs> And 
And then on the opposite side of the spectrum, I can totally just eliminate the uh, amp and go Michael Thompson style straight in direct to the board. So here it is with the amp. And here it is kind of going direct, I guess. So actually I could put like a preamp, like a, let's do a Neve 1073, give it a little boost, and then kind of EQ it, make it brighter, maybe take some out, take the bass out a little bit. some mids honestly I am so stoked with how this turned out it's like instant 80s to me I'm totally loving it. Uh, you guys let me know what you guys think of this tone. Did I nail it? Did I come close? Did I fail? Let me know down in the comments. Also, let me know what you guys think of 80s tone in general. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them down below. If you enjoyed this video, please click that thumbs up. Share it with your friends and family. Somebody that also likes to wear 80s logo throwback shirts. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, gear demos and guitar lessons, click the subscribe button. Thanks again for watching. I'm RJ Ronquillo, and I'll see you in the next video.